We've been going through a series in 1 Peter called Higher Up. And uh, our pastor, David, has been doing, I think, an incredible job leading us through some challenging passages. I think many of you here would acknowledge uh, when we're talking about issues of, of authority and, and government, we're talking about suffering, persecution. These are, these are weighty, heavy things. And there's no doubt that our text this morning is a challenging one as well. Let me ask you a question. And uh, I really want you to, to think about the answer to this. What is the most difficult thing that you've ever had to do in your life? I don't mean the most physically challenging. I'm, I'm talking about the most emotionally trying thing, the most gut-wrenching thing you've ever had to do. What is that for you? You know, for some of us, it might be you walking through the terminal illness of a loved one. Others of you, it's, it's the process of forgiving someone that, that has hurt you so deeply. Uh, maybe there's, there's parents in here, you have adult children that have just walked away and, you, and your, your continual love to try to draw them back and yet there's still a rejection of you and a rejection of the Lord. Maybe for others here, you've been accused of something, something you didn't do, and you're still living under the consequences of another person's lie. You know, these are challenging things. These are, these are cross-bearing things. These are things that people experience in life. Many of you have experienced them. And in, in, in the middle of them, we find great challenge. But through them, we see that God can be honored, that God can be exalted even in these dark places that we find ourselves. And in our text this morning, that's exactly what we find. We find God calling a group of people who are in a horrible situation to honor God with their lives. Now, before we, we jump into to that text specifically, I want us to, to look back at a text that we looked at two weeks ago. Because in many respects, this verse is a summary statement over all that follows. And, and, and that verse is 1 Peter 2.12. It'll be on your screens. 1 Peter 2.12 says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So keep our, we should keep our lives honorable among them. We should live in such a way that when they speak against us as evildoers, this is really speaking against our identity as, as, as Christians, but they, then they would see our good deeds, see the way of our life, and bring glory to God on the day of visitation. And so Peter was, was telling his readers, hey, look, Christ can be honored through your life regardless of your circumstances. You know, last week, we, Pastor David preached a message about yielding, submitting to civil authorities. And there's no doubt that, that the authorities in the Roman world were not Christian. They were not honorable in that sort of way. And yet, there was still a call to show them honor. And in our passage this morning in 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25, we're going to see that Peter is calling Christian slaves to live honorably in the households in which they serve. Now, here's what you need to know, is that in the Roman world and in the, Roman, in the, in the church of the Roman Empire, there were both free people and there were enslaved people. In fact, many historians believe that one-third of the urban population of the Roman Empire were enslaved. And in the churches, in the churches there actually were many enslaved people who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And let's just be honest. This is a challenging text for us with a horrendous history of slavery here in the United States. It's hard for us to even consider the things that are happening in this context. Now, let me say this. There were some differences between Greco-Roman slavery and slavery in the Americas. However, I think we go way too far if we think that slavery somehow in their context was not unjust. It absolutely was. And that's, we're going to find that in this passage, the injustice that these men and women are experiencing. You know, I, I pray today that we'll allow God's word to speak to us 
about how we, we are to live out our lives as Christians in a way that honors him, even in these dark places we may find where mistreatment and threats might be common. You know, in our community and around the world today, Christians are living under the thumb of injustice. They might be living in a home where there is abuse. They might be experiencing severe persecution at the hands of their family or their government. They might be trafficked into sexual slavery or forced labor. They might even have been falsely accused of something and imprisoned for a crime they did not commit. And, and let's just be, let's be clear before we get into this text. For anyone who finds themselves in those circumstances, if they can find safety and justice, every single one of us would encourage that. We would say, flee, find safety, get justice for yourself. And yet, possibly in our community, but definitely around the world, that's not always possible. And it definitely wasn't the case for these slaves that Peter was writing to. It wasn't an option for them just to leave the situation they were in. Now, some, no doubt, would win their freedom. They would secure their freedom in the days ahead. But many would continue serving as slaves for most of their life. And so the question is this. How could they honor Christ in the midst of such injustice? How, how could they serve him and bring him glory when life was so dark? It may be for you today that you have found yourself in a place of severe mistreatment and even abuse. Maybe you feel trapped by a situation that you're in and you're not sure what to do. I hope today that Peter's words, ultimately the Spirit's words, will be an encouragement to you and that as we look at these three ways to exalt Christ in the midst of suffering and justice, that the Lord would speak to you. And so let's look at this. Let's look at what Peter says in this passage. We're going to find three ways to exalt Christ while suffering injustice. And the first is this, that we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. Look at 1 Peter 2, verses 18 through 20. Peter writes, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Peter tells them to be mindful of the Lord, to, to realize that he sees what is happening to them and that, and that they can have faithful endurance in the sight of God. You know, the host of heaven, the Lord, the angels, they are a witness to our lives. And there is no doubt that, that, that they see every, every detail of the things that are, that, that are occurring. And they see even when we are suffering. You know, I, I think about when uh, the deacon Stephen, you know, he was newly appointed deacon. And he's given amazing testimony to who Christ was. And there was, unfortunately, this, this crowd of Jews that had gathered that became very angry at his words. And they began to stone him. They began to kill him over his testimony of Christ. And as he was stoned, he looked up into heaven. And do you know what he saw? He saw Jesus. He saw Jesus standing, bearing witness to his suffering for Christ. You know, I don't know if you know this, but one in seven Christians around the world today experience persecution. That's 300 and 65 million people who on a daily basis might experience threat or confiscation of their property, or maybe they might be beaten, or the threat of prison, or even being killed for their faith. But one of the things that aids them, one of the things that strengthens them to endure is they know that God sees 
They know that Jesus is aware of what's happening, and he is bearing testimony to them as they bear testimony to him. Um, One of the most challenging places, in fact, most oppressive places to be a Christian around the world is in North Korea. And I want us us to watch a video that gives testimony of a young lady named Bay. And you're going to see that part of Bay's strength, part of her ability to endure is that she sees and knows that God sees. Let's watch her testimony on our screens. Hongjanin 그리고 우리는 그리스도인이었기 때문에 머나먼 곳으로 추방되었습니다. 이제 결코 도망갈 수 없게 되었습니다. 여기서 일하는 것은 힘이 듭니다. 배급도 충분하지 않습니다. 우리는 항상 배고프고 또 아픕니다. 여기서는 살아남기 위해서 스스로 먹을 것을 찾아 나서야 합니다. 그러나 매일 아침 눈을 뜰때주 하나님의 임재를 느낍니다. 여전히 주의 종으로 섬길 수 있도록 강건하게 하시는 우리 아버지 하나님께 감사드립니다. 사람이 떡으로만 살 것이 아니오 하나님의 입으로 나오는 모든 말씀으로 살 것이라 어려운 기회로 최근에 국경을 넘어 다른 그리스도인들을 만날 기회가 있었습니다 그들은 저에게 음식과 약도 주고 또 주님의 은혜로 성경책도 주었습니다 그곳에 있었을 때더 머물 수 있는 기회가 있었습니다 제가 자유로워질 수 있는 순간이었습니다 그러나 저는 저의 가족과 교회를 저버릴 수 없었습니다. 아무리 작은 교회라도 말입니다. 여러분의 입장에서 보았을 때 우리가 고통당하는 것이 저주처럼 보일지도 모릅니다. 그러나 우리는 이것을 축복으로 압니다. 아버지께로 가는 지름길이기 때문입니다. 그러나 공교롭게도 부탁이 하나 더 있습니다. 우리를 위하여 기도하는 분들에게 우리가 얼마나 감사한 마음을 가지고 있는지 전달해 주시기를 부탁드립니다. 우리는 여기서 건강하게 잘 견디겠습니다. 그리고 북한 땅에 계속해서 주님의 복음을 전하겠습니다. 여러분의 잠에 울림 yeah. Powerful testimony that is true, not just of Bay, but of many believers in North Korea and actually believers around the world. And, and though you and I may never experience anything as severe as, as, as Bay, the reality is, is that her testimony ought to be an encouragement to us to keep our eyes on Jesus. We find ourselves in a situation that feels hopeless and oppressive. And so here we find this, this first thing that that this first way to exalt Christ in the midst of our suffering is that we keep our eyes on Jesus. The second that Peter mentions is that we should keep our lives free from hatred. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there were a good number of slaves that had become Christians in the churches of the first century. And, and, And here they had not only placed their faith in Christ, but they were now submitting to the lordship of Jesus. He was now their master. And, and the question was, with, with Jesus as my master, then 
how am I supposed to submit and how, how should I relate to these, these human and earthly masters, particularly the ones that are unjust? And Peter's answer to them, and, and this is not easy for us to hear, Peter's answer to them is to be submissive, to show respect, to do good. And, and though that seems to be incomprehensible, how in the world could Peter call these believing slaves to live that way? And his answer is this, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. You see, any time that we are mistreated as Christians, we really only have two options in how we respond. The way of the flesh and the way of Jesus. And these two things are poles apart. The way of the flesh is easy. It's natural for us. You know, when, when, when someone, you know, slaps us, figuratively or literally, we're going to slap them back even harder. We're going to take revenge. We're going to have hatred to, be, to brew in our hearts. It's the way of the flesh. The way of Jesus is far different. The way of Jesus is supernatural. It requires the power of the Holy Spirit to not revile when reviled, to not threaten when threatened, to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek, to pray for those who persecute us. These are things that require the work of the Spirit. And some of you today, some of you today, you are facing things in your home, in your workplace, in your school, in your community, where you feel the weight of injustice. It's so easy so easy for any of us to allow those feelings of hatred and revenge to brew. I want you to listen to the story of a man named Richard Wormbrand. Richard Wormbrand was a Lutheran priest in the middle of the 20th century uh, in Romania. And Romania at this time was a communist nation that was seeking to press down all practice of Christianity. But Richard Wormbrand was bold, he was courageous, and he was imprisoned. And for 14 years, as he languished in, in, a, in a Romanian jail, he was also tortured for his faith. After he was eventually released, he actually founded a ministry that, that some of you are familiar with. It's called the Voice of the Martyrs. Here's a picture of him in prison. You can see the weight a prison on his face. He founded a ministry called the Voice of the Martyrs. And the Voice of the Martyrs is a global ministry that seeks to serve the needs of the persecuted church. But what I want you to hear Richard Wormbrand's words in a book that he wrote called Tortured for Christ. To hear his words of how he saw people responding to abuse with the way of Jesus. I have seen Christians in communist prisons with 50 pounds of chains on their feet, tortured with red hot iron pokers, in whose throats spoonfuls of salt have been forced, being kept afterward without water, starving, whipped, suffering from cold, and praying with fervor for the communists. This is humanly inexplicable, meaning it's not explainable. It is the love of Christ which was poured out in our hearts. 
Some of us here today need to draw deeply from the will of Christ, his, his, his power to forgive because we've been hurt so deeply. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it is. It's, it's, it's a past history of abuse. Maybe it, it is some sort of harm that you receive because of, of someone's lies or deception. Maybe it's, because, maybe it's that you were and are oppressed because of the color of your skin or your ethnic background or because of your faith. Let me say this. Forgiveness does not excuse sin. Our forgiveness of someone who has hurt us does not excuse their sin. Rather, it's a radical demonstration that we believe two things. First, that God can be trusted. He can be trusted to do what is right. That he, in the end, he will bring his justice. And number two, the second reason why we can not hold hatred but show forgiveness is because God has already forgiven us of so much. And this is where we see Peter turn to the third way that we exalt Christ in the midst of suffering and justice. And that is to keep our hearts centered on the gospel. Look at verse, verses 24 and 25. Peter writes, speaking of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseers of your soul. Meditating upon the truths of the gospel in word, in prayer, in, in, in conversation, in song is the secret to faithfulness in the Christian life, especially when we find ourselves in situations where it's so difficult and challenging. Situations like these Christian men and women who were enslaved found themselves in. And, and I believe that what we find in these last two verses where, where Peter is, is focusing in, he's zeroing in on the gospel of Jesus Christ, I think we find three key gospel truths for anyone who may find themselves suffering under injustice. And I want us to walk through them quickly. So number one, we see that Jesus took on all of our sin on the cross. Every single one of us in here and every single one throughout time has broken God's righteous law, his righteous commands. That's sin, that we've rebelled against him, that we've, we've chosen our own way. The Bible tells us that because of that, we're deserving of judgment. In this context, that would be both masters and the enslaved. But universally, it's every single one of us. Every single one of us have fallen short of the glory of God because of our sin. But here's the incredible thing that Peter also mentions in this passage, is that Jesus bore our sin in his body on the cross. These, these two truths that we, we have this common need because we're all sinners, and this common need. Savior, level the ground at the cross. I want you to know this, whether you're listening online or you're here in this room, Jesus offers forgiveness to any who would turn to him. Maybe as I speak about injustice, you're not the one suffering injustice today, but maybe you're the one giving it out. You're the one who through your actions is an abuser. You're the one who is enslaving someone around you. You are trapping them, and you know it's you. Jesus' forgiveness is available to you. He died for your sins as well. And so regardless of who you are today, every single one of us has a common need, forgiveness for sin, and a common solution, a common Savior in Jesus Christ. 
We also see another gospel truth here is that Jesus did this. He bore our sin in his body on the cross that we might live a life like his, a life that is dead to sin and alive to righteousness. This is a life that is unbound by the world. In fact, in many respects, this was the secret to how these, 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 these brothers and sisters in Christ who happened to be chained, figured to these sometimes literally, were going to live free because Jesus had set them free. They were no longer bound by this world. They were alive to righteousness, alive to a life in Christ which could honor the Lord even in the horrible circumstance in which they found themselves. This is God's power. This third truth that we find here in these last two verses regarding the gospel is that Jesus is calling us to follow him because he cares for us. He's calling us to choose the way of Jesus, even though it may be challenging, because he cares for us says here that Jesus is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. He knows what's best. He actually loves us. And, and though sometimes he will lead us through a valley of the shadow of death, at the end of the day, it's green pastures and still waters that he has planned for us. The question for us, though, is will we trust him? Will, will we allow him to lead us through our pain? You know, for those of you in this room or, or online that, that are experiencing injustice today, I pray that you would hear Peter's words and that you would allow them to not just, not just comfort you, but encourage you of how you can exalt Jesus, even under the thumb of injustice. But let's be honest, there are plenty of us in this room that aren't experiencing any measure of injustice. And so what about us? What would the Bible call us to do? I mean, in this passage, there, there isn't thing, anything specific, but what would the Bible more broadly call us to do who have brothers and sisters who are? Well, the Bible would tell us to be advocates, to be defenders. You know, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to see yet, but there's an amazing documentary on Apple TV that's called The Bloody Hundredth. It's, it's the story of, 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 of men who are part of the 100th Bomber Group in World War II. And for 22 months, 22 months, they flew uh, these, uh, these flights from England or from the UK into enemy territory. 8,000 missions, 700 of them were killed. 900 were taken as prisoners of war. Every single time they got into a plane to fly, they knew there was a chance. They weren't coming back. And yet they kept doing it. Why? Because they were willing to stand up against the grave injustices that they saw around them. These, these grave injustices that the Nazi Third Reich was carrying out upon people who couldn't defend themselves. You know, the Lord calls us as believers in Christ to be defenders, to be courageous, to step into situations where injustice may be alive and to bear some of the weight for others. You know, I, I love what Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says. It says this, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. You know, one of the things that I love about Central Bible Church is that many of you are doing this. You know, I think about as you, as you foster, as you adopt, as you, as you care for the poor in our community, as you, as you support uh, the persecuted around the world, as you stand up for racism, Stand against racism as you, as you love and speak for the unborn. You are doing these things. And, and what I would tell you is we want to continue to raise up new generations of gospel-centered justice defenders, gospel warriors who will step into hard places. 
And, and to do that, to, to encourage you in this, we're going to offer some, what we call some lunch and learns in the weeks ahead. These are times for us to gather together after the second service, to have lunch together, and to learn about some of the issues in our community where injustice is being experienced. Uh, here in the weeks ahead, you can see we're going to have a lunch and learn on human trafficking and how you can partner with our, um, our, our, our local compassion partner, Traffic 911, and how to pray for those who are trafficked, how to, how to even step in and possibly be a part of seeing trafficking end. Then on May 5th, uh, we are going to be speaking about uh, children that are in foster care and how you can either foster or adopt or, or serve as a, a, a CASA or provide respite care. And in the fall, we're going we're gonna to seek to do even more of these. If, if, if many of you show interest, I think we're going to do some on the persecuted church and other issues. The reality is this, is that God has called us to justice. He has called us to seek his justice, both spiritually and physically as well, for those that are around us. Today, we're going to take communion as a family, as a church family. And I'm going to go ahead and invite our communion servers to go ahead and actually come up and to, to get their stations ready. As, as we take communion, let me just remind us that this is a meal that we observe on a regular basis that reminds us of the death of Christ. It focuses our heart on the fact that, that Jesus was a sacrifice for our sin, that he paid the penalty for it. He did what we could not do for ourselves. And, and as you come, what I want you to be thinking about is, is maybe one of two things. Maybe for some of you, it's that you need to set your eyes on Jesus. Maybe you're experiencing something horrible in your life. Maybe you really are in a place of injustice and you need to tune your heart, tune your mind to the fact that the Lord sees you, that he cares for you, you can trust him. You, you, you may need to come, it may be that you're needing to, to help, ask the Lord to help you to forgive someone because the Lord's forgiven you of so much. For others, it may be that you come to this table recognizing that Jesus gave up his life as an example, that we would give up our lives as well, that we too would be willing to stand in and stand up for those that don't know Jesus or that are suffering greatly. And so however the Lord leads, I pray that you would come and you would be willing to allow the Lord to speak to you today. Let me just share a couple of, of practical matters before I pray for us and, and you stand and come. Today, we're really going to ask that these outside aisles, this far one over here and this far one over there, that you would not come down them, okay? We, we, we want to use those as, as, as exits, allow people to exit that direction. And so utilize one of these, uh, these four middle aisles here, and we'll direct you. And we, as always, we invite you to, to come forward with, with family, uh, in community, and allow this to be a grace that God speaks to you in. And so let me go ahead and invite you to stand, and then we're going to pray. Father, this, this morning, this is, a, this is a weighty text, Lord. Ah, I, I just, I mean, to think what these brothers and sisters, so many of them were facing. Unjust masters that were oppressing them. And so many just, it, it, it could feel as if there was... It's a hopeless situation. I thank you, Lord, that you gave them hope through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You, you gave them eyes to see that they could live differently. They could even love those who had hurt them so much. Thank you, Jesus, that you ultimately are our model for this. You're the one who suffered and never threatened in return. You're the one who gave up yourself. Lord, that we might actually have life, we who were against you. And so today, Lord, we come to your table and we, we pray that you would use it to remind us of who you are and who, by your grace, you've called us to be as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Oh, yes, I'm sorry. There are also, thank you, David. There are also uh, communion stations in the back as well if you want to gather there. You can come.